Good morning, everybody. As always, just giving it a moment for those of you who are joining, for everybody who's joining online. Thank you for being with us and hope everybody's having a great week. We have a really wonderful presenter with us today. And uh, the, the nice news is uh, we really don't have many COVID related updates, which really reflects just how relatively well things are doing. One major update that uh, came from Dr. Weinecker, who's currently in the ICU today, so I, I'm just going to give a brief update, is the inpatient visitor rules changed on Tuesday this week, and it's much more relaxed, and we're really happy to see that. The main update, and there's a whole, it was in the newsletter this week, and I can send it out in the um, uh, the chat here as well, but the main change is you can have up to two healthy visitors a day during visiting hours. Um, and if a healthy if a healthy visitor is under age 18, they may, they may visit one adult as well. So it's a much more relaxed. We can have two people coming in. It's not restricted to just two people for um, the whole hospitalization as well. There's a, a lot of other subtleties as well I can send with it. Uh, and also COVID-19 patients can also even have one healthy visitor, um, a lot less of those patients in the hospital. So really happy to see that. That being said, I will turn it over now to Dr. Harmon. Dr. Harmon, again, I mentioned before, thank you so much to you and our other colleagues for helping set up a lot of our speakers this month, including today's speaker. I'll turn over to you to uh, talk about upcoming ones and uh, just welcome our new speaker. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Osdalga. Um, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to highlight our upcoming um, Medicine Grand Round speakers um, and before I introduce uh, today's Speaker. So March 16th, next Wednesday, we'll be having Dr. Odette Harris, who is a professor here of neurosurgery, who will be speaking on um, traumatic brain injury and the gender differences that she's seen in her research. She is the director of the Stanford um, Spinal Cord. Um, <laughs> On March 23rd, the following week, we'll have Dr. Jacqueline Antonovich, who is Assistant Professor of History at the Muhlenberg College, speaking on gender, race, um, and the history of women in medicine. Um, and then March 30th, we'll have Dr. Adriana Hung, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Vanderbilt um, and in nephrology. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd love to introduce now our speaker for this morning. So it is, is my distinct pleasure and honor to be introducing uh, our Grand Round speaker, Dr. Holly Tabor. So Dr. Tabor is an assist, Associate Professor of Medicine here at Stanford, uh, as well as um, uh, has a faculty appointment in the Department of Epidemiology. She's the Associate Director for Clinical Ethics and Education for the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics and co-chairs both the ethics committees at Stanford Hospital, as well as Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Her research focuses primarily on ethical issues in genetics and genomics, um, particularly surrounding rare and undiagnosed diseases and disability. She received her PhD actually here in epidemiology um, and then uh, was recruited to the University of Washington, where she was an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics, as well as in the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics at Seattle Children's before uh, returning here to Stanford in 2016. Uh, amongst her current work and studies, she is principal investigator for a patient-centered outcomes research institute or PCORI study, which is building a research collaborative for people with intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities. Of note, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, she also co-founded the not-for-profit organization, Meals of Gratitude, with restaurateur and local chef, Jesse Cool, raising over $450,000 and providing over 20,000 meals of appreciation for Stanford healthcare clinicians and staff. And I know myself and, and many others have been beneficiaries of that during the pandemic. Uh, and I, I want to say that Dr. Tabor has been and continues to be a model for me in her leadership and advocacy on both an individual level and on a policy level. She will be speaking to us today on ethics, disability, and inclusion in medicine. Without further ado, Dr. Holly Tabor. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for that incredibly kind introduction. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me today. I am just going to share my screen. Um, Stephanie, can you give me a thumbs up that you can see that? Great. Okay. Always have to pray to the Zoom God. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I wanted to share um, a topic that I've been thinking about and working on and collaborating with a lot of people on during the last two years that we've been in this pandemic situation, and particularly how it relates to broader issues involving ethics, disability, and inclusion in medicine. Um, 
So I'm going to start out by talking about what is inclusive healthcare and why is it an ethical issue. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed about challenges for people with disabilities in obtaining healthcare. Then I'm going to give a couple of examples of access and equity issues that have been magnified and amplified by the pandemic, specifically for disabilities. We've had some other amazing talks and grand rounds about um, some of the other kinds of health equity issues that have been magnified in the pandemic by experts um, talking about it. And then I'm going to talk at the end a little bit about some of the work that we're doing and also some ideas for this audience about how this crisis can maybe be a tipping point for change and transformation and how um, can and should bioethics, my field, and healthcare providers providers and medicine support that change. So um, this is a picture of my son, Colin, um, shared with his permission um, from a couple of years ago. And I just wanted to share one of the reasons why I have become so invested in thinking about intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I am a parent of someone with autism. So I have some firsthand experiences um, of, uh, of people experiencing disabilities and how it affects them. But through him, he's actually been my teacher. Um, and he has connected me with a very um, large number of friends and connections throughout the disability community. And he's really taught me about the need to seek out and listen to the perspectives of people with disabilities. Um, separately, in the last year, I've discovered that I have some hearing loss. So I'm also starting to experience the world a little bit from the perspective of people with disabilities in general. Um, so I always like to start with this because I think it's really an important part of, of how this frames the way I think about some of the issues that I'm going to share with you today. So what is inclusive healthcare and what are the ideas behind inclusive healthcare? Um, one of the key principles is that people with disabilities have a right to equitable access to healthcare and full participation in health programs and services. And that providers, health systems, and society have um, obligations, moral, ethical, and legal obligations to make healthcare more accessible to full participation by people with all forms of disability. And to do this, we really need several different levels of change. We need individual level change um, on the behalf of particular providers, policy changes, both policy changes within institutions and within healthcare as, a, as, a, um, as an area, technological changes and societal changes on a transformational level. And we'll talk about that um, throughout this talk. I could give a whole nother grand rounds about um, the data about the common barriers for people with disabilities um, accessing care, um, but this is a website that will be available later from the CDC describing some of the barriers, including attitudinal barriers, communication barriers, physical barriers, all these different kinds of barriers, even transportation, even just being able to get to the clinic. Um, and what's important, um, especially when you think about those, the, what inclusive healthcare means, and I described in the previous slide, is that people with disabilities experience significantly greater health risks and poor health, health outcomes, including higher rates of obesity and smoking, lack of physical activity, and increased rates of newly diagnosed cases of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. They're also at higher risk for injury, and they're more likely to report rape or sexual assault they also rate poorly on almost all measures of social determinants of health, including education, employment, and income. Um, and uh, they also face specific ch uh, challenges and barriers in, um, in getting care. Um, so specifically, um, a survey in 2011 by the census reported um, that um, uh, large numbers of people with disabilities face inaccessible medical facilities and services, including those with mobility disability, about 20 million, cognitive disability, about 14 million people, hearing disability, 10 million, and vision disability, 6 million. Um, and one study, this was really shocking to me when I started doing this work, one study found that fewer than half of primary care facilities serving Medicaid patients in California were fully architecturally accessible, with less than 10% having accessible examination tables or weight scales. Um, and furthermore, as I'll give you some examples later in this talk, there are few, if any, resources to guide people with disabilities in finding healthcare providers and institutions that can provide accommodations for their specific needs. Um, there are also challenges um, in cost and insurance. Adults with disabilities are two and a half times more likely to report skipping or delaying healthcare because of cost than adults without disabilities. So why is inclusive healthcare an ethics issue? I'm a, a, a card-carrying bioethicist. Um, and this will probably be familiar to many of you. Um, there's a lot um, in both our, our medical education and in the bioethics literature about the four principles of bioethics, um, which are autonomy, um, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And as you think about this, you can think that autonomy is important for people with disabilities because we wanna respect the rights of disabled people to make their own decisions as much as possible about their healthcare and their quality of life. 
We want to try to benefit them and improve their quality of life and the length of their lives according to their own definitions of benefits. We want to not harm them or deny them care, particularly on the basis of their disability. And we want to treat disabled people fairly and equitably, allowing them equitable access to care and benefits. Um, and unfortunately, these challenges are occurring in the context of a degree of um, bias and ableism in society, and that, that bias and ableism exists among physicians as well. This is a really one and a really important series of papers um, that was published by Lisa Iazzoni from Harvard and from Mass General, which was a survey of 714 practicing US physicians. Um, and they found that over 80% reported that people with significant disability have a worse quality of life than non-disabled people, which was cited as a a, a potential bias about the actual quality of life of many people with disabilities. Um, 40% were very confident, um, sorry, only 40% were very confident about their ability to provide the same quality of care to disabled patients, so that's actually not very encouraging. And 56% strongly agree, only 56% strongly agree that they welcome disabled people into their practice. Um, so this was really, um, uh, unfortunately, quite depressing data, although perhaps not surprising, about the fact that many physicians um, don't really know how to take care of people with disabilities, don't often welcome them into their practice, don't feel very confident about it, and have some of the same biases that much of society has about the quality of life and perspectives of people with disability about their quality of life. So one of the things I want to outline today as an example um, is the fact that COVID-19 has devastated and unfortunately continues to devastate disabled people, revealing and amplifying health disparities and injustices. And a metaphor that I like to use when I talk about this is um, from this um, very famous painting of the Great Wave off of Kanagawa by um, the um, wonderful artist Hokusai from the 1800s. And most of you, many of you may have seen this picture. Um, when I saw this picture, I always thought it was a tsunami, but a, on doing some research about it, it's actually not a tsunami. It's a rogue wave, also called a plunging wave or a killer wave. It's estimated to be about 40 feet tall. You can see that relevant to the fishing boats that are in the picture. Um, and ironically, a rogue wave like this is actually, as some of you may know, often considered to be the best kind of wave to surf. Um, and I think that's really interesting. This idea that out of a lot of a turbulence can also come a stable and beautiful pipeline, creating a transformative experience. And so today I'm gonna argue that COVID-19 is like a great rogue wave. It, it's causing terrible destruction. It's affecting more people, um, some people more than others, including those with disabilities. But I think it's also creating transformative opportunities for change and for justice. So I want to start out by talking about the data and what we know about how COVID-19 has disproportionately affected disabled people. Um, these are some of the headlines from er, uh, the on the left is a very early headline um, from the pandemic um, from the New York Times about how um, they were seeing higher rates of COVID-19 in people with disabilities. Um, and in Pennsylvania, the early numbers showed that people with intellectual disabilities and autism who tested positive for COVID-19 died at a rate about twice as high as other Pennsylvania residents who didn't have um, intellectual disabilities. Those numbers were very similar in New York and in other states. Um, and like many vulnerable groups, um, these individuals, adults with intellectual disabilities, were disproportionately affected in other ways too. They were at higher risk of contracting it, dying it, and having dying from it and having long-term complications. It was not clear that they got the same levels of and quality of care as those without um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. One large study found that adults with intellectual disabilities were less likely to be transferred to the ICU for care than other COVID-19 patients. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, this is um, an analysis that came from the Fair um, Health National Private Insurance Claims Repository. Um, and uh, this was um, analyzing claims um, from April 1st, 2020 to August 31st, 2020, and examining the relationship between the outcome of mortality and um, various independent variables, including existing pre uh, pre-existing comorbidities. Um, and um, you'll see, it may be hard to see, but the, the furthest left bar and the and the third to the furthest left, left, left bar are developmental disorders and intellectual disabilities and related conditions. Um, and that with an odds ratio of 3.06, patients with COVID-19 and developmental disorders were three times more likely to die than patients who had COVID-19 but not developmental disorders. Um, so that was highly significant. Um, and I, I, when I've shared this data um, uh, several times since it came out, people have been really surprised by this. I don't think that um, the, the um, nature of the high risk for this population has actually um, been something that people have been aware of either in the general public or in medicine in particular. So I think this data is really striking. And while it's early in the pandemic, um, some of the data shows that these disparities still exist. Um, 
there has been some press about how people with intellectual disabilities in particular are often overlooked in the pandemic response. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of areas in which there have been specific barriers um, to uh, people with intellectual disabilities getting care, receiving fair access to care and inclusive healthcare, getting vaccination and getting other services. Um, many of you may remember that early in the pandemic when we were quite concerned about um, not having enough ventilators and there were parts of the country in the world in which we did not have enough ventilators and we had to um, uh, undergo ventilator triage using crisis standards of care, it became unfortunately clear quite quickly um, that our crisis standards of care policies actually in many cases were um, very biased and discriminatory towards people with disabilities, especially people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, and in ways that were actually illegal. Um, this is uh, three examples from many examples um, of three states that had crisis standards of care policy um, that were actually found by the Office of Civil Rights to be in violation of the civil rights of people with disabilities. For example, Alabama um, had in their crisis standards of care that people with severe or profound intellectual disability are unlikely candidates for ventilator support. So this was really quite striking and very concerning. Um, and a lot of people in the disability rights and advocacy community um, and the organizations that are involved actually got, um, uh, and a lot of um, the legal organizations that advocate for people with disabilities sort of got very involved in trying to change this quickly. Um, this is a quote from Ari Neiman, who's a visiting scholar at Brandeis and the founder of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network um, at this time when, we, when there was this ventilator triage discrimination issue. And he said, people with disabilities are terrified. They're terrified that when it comes to scarce resources like ventilators, they'll be sent to the back of the line. Our civil rights don't go away in the midst of a pandemic. We don't suddenly replace the ADA or other civil rights laws with generalized utilitarianism the moment things get difficult. And I think this was um, something that was really striking to people and people um, were often surprised by the degree to which there was sort of discriminatory, discriminatory um, uh, uh, assumptions and practices embedded in the way we thought about allocation of scarce resources through crisis standards of care. My colleague and friend, Joe Stramundo, who's a philosopher at San Diego State, also wrote an article at this time. And he said, just because there may not be a perfect non-discriminatory set of rationing criteria, that doesn't mean there aren't better or worse ways of doing triage. Um, and then he added this, which I think is really important. And he's written extensively um, on this. There's a significant body of empirical evidence showing there's a substantial difference between a disabled person's self-assessment and how their quality of life is judged by folks that have never experienced their disability. Some prominent bioethicists even refer to this as the disability paradox. So that goes back to the data that I showed you from Iazoni et al from their survey that over 80% of physicians judge the quality of life with people with disabilities to be low. There's a significant difference between the way um, non-disabled people in society and often physicians view the quality of life with people with disabilities and the way they view it themselves. Um, and so I mentioned that many advocates and advocacy groups um, got, to, got to work trying to um, address and combat and actually sue to try to change these crisis standards of care. Um, on the left is a document that was created by a number of leading groups um, uh, advocating for people with disabilities that actually created an evaluation framework for crisis standards of care plans that both states and hospitals and healthcare institutions could use to try to ensure that they weren't even accidentally um, including um, things that were discriminatory towards people with disabilities. Disabilities. And the Office of Civil Rights got very involved, um, even during the former presidential administration, and um, actually got Alabama and many of the other states to actually change um, their crisis standards of care. But I think it was really revealing that this came up in the first place. Um, then, as, as most of you know, we were very fortunate to have the vaccines um, be developed and approved um, and become available. Um, but in the context of vaccination, there were also important disparities in the ways that people with disabilities and their caregivers were able to access vaccination, particularly in the first few months that vaccines were available, despite the fact that, as I showed you, there was some data that at least for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, that they were really um, at much higher risk of being infected and of dying. Um, this is an article by my colleagues, Megan Halley and Christina Mendoza from the New England Journal about some of the challenges with caregivers actually not getting access to vaccines early in the pandemic. And this was a problem for many people with disabilities who rely on personal care assistance and other kinds of um, other kinds of caregivers, um, that they, um, they were really at very high risk in getting infected um, disproportionately from their caregivers coming in to take care of them. They could not live without their caregivers coming in to help them with their activities of daily living or other care. And yet, um, our, almost all of the um, initial policies um, prioritizing vaccination 
Nation did not treat um, people who were involved in taking care of people with disabilities and illness as having, uh, other than healthcare providers in healthcare institutions, as having priority for vaccination. Um, the second picture is a commentary that I wrote with Joe Stramundo um, that was dealing with the fact that um, uh, uh, many states, including California, were really slow to prioritize disabled Californians for the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and there was a lot of activism and a lot of lobbying, um, and um, it was really a challenge. I'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, also, separately across the country, um, it became really clear that many of the websites that people use to try to make appointments for vaccine were not accessible to people who had visual disabilities, um, that they were unable to sign up for the vaccines or, main, or obtain other vital information because many websites, including government websites, lack required accessibility features. And this is true of the web in general, and there's a lot that's been written about this. Um, some of you may have heard of Haben Gurma, who's a lawyer who's blind um, and hearing impaired, and she also has done some important work on this. At least seven 7.6 million people in the US over 16 have a visual disability. Um, and on January 27th, it was found that there was accessibility, accessibility issues on all of the state and District of Columbia in, um, pages about vaccine information. So this was a really, and, and still is today, a very significant problem in the ways that people with disabilities can access our tools that we use to actually get them healthcare in general and vaccination in particular for COVID-19. Um, I mentioned that different states were uh, very slow in actually uh, approving the access of people with disabilities to the vaccine. And because of this, my colleague Bonnie Lynn Sweener at Johns Hopkins, um, as part of the Disability Health Research Institute, um, and her colleagues created a COVID-19 vaccine prioritization dashboard, which I really encourage you to take a look at, as well as a lot of the other um, amazing resources that they have there. Um, and they provide and still update information about, um, uh, but it was very important early on when vaccines were not widely available about what state policies were about whether or not people with disabilities could get access to the vaccine. Um, very early on in the state of California, they, they limited it to people with epilepsy and Down syndrome and cerebral palsy, but no other disabilities. Um, and that was coming partly from the CDC guidance, but there was really a lot of confusion and people with disabilities didn't know whether they were able to get vaccines or not. So I really um, commend um, Dr. Sweener for doing this and I um, really encourage you to look at her website. Um, since then, a lot of organizations have worked hard to try to think about how we can make vaccination um, and testing, for that matter, accessible to people with disabilities, including people with intellectual disabilities and older adults. Um, and this is from the um, Administration for Community Living, which is a, a federal organization about creating an accessible vaccine experience for people with disabilities and older adults. I'm not going to read this, but you can see that there's three categories of accessibility, communication, and appointments. And um, I, I have been helping a lot of people and a lot of organizations try to find vaccines. And I have to say that most of the places I've seen um, could do a lot to try to move in this direction to um, uh, actually meet some of these, what I think are fairly easy to meet benchmarks for making vaccination more accessible to people with disabilities. Um, this is a, a couple of screenshots from the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network's website about some of the resources that they have made. And there are some other organizations that have done this as well. On the left is what's called a plain language um, a document that's written for people um, with disabilities where they may need language to be um, simplified to explain why you should get the COVID-19 vaccine. And on the right is a video they make. And so there are organizations that are trying to make information um, accessible to people with disabilities, but um, the vast majority of these are not um, accessible. Our people with um, disabilities may not be aware of them and may not have access to them. I just wanted to give a shout out. Um, uh, earlier in February, um, the School of Medicine flu crew with medical students and PA students um, actually participated in collaboration with Lauren Clark, who's a, a medical student here, um, and uh, um, also with um, uh, Special Olympics Cal uh, Northern California and Ability Path, which is an organization that serves, serves people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to have a vaccination pop up. And it was really moving to be there to see even in February, how many people, both adults and children with intellectual and developmental disabilities had already still had very significant challenges in getting a vaccine for a number of reasons. So we were doing it in a particular location with particular training to try to make it as easy as possible for people to get it. And it was really striking to see how successful that was and how really important was um, to give people that opportunity. So I think there are still some, some opportunities and challenges to make sure we fully reach this population, both with um, initial vaccination and with boosters.
So another area in which there's been issues about disability inclusion is, is about um, how we've used big data and AI and calculators to think about the COVID-19 pandemic. And some of you may be aware, Johns Hopkins um, for some time has had this really um, clever COVID-19 mortality risk calculator. If you haven't looked at it, I encourage you to look at it. Um, and I wanted to go through it and explain why it demonstrates some of the challenges in how disability is considered in terms of AI and big data. Um, so this is what the website looks like. It asks you to enter your age, your zip code, your race, your gender, your height and your weight. It asks you if you smoke, and then it has a couple of um, a couple of chronic conditions for you to check to see if you have that. And then it gives you a, a risk calculator, and this was my risk calculator, um, and I was in the green zone. Um, and it tells you what your risk is um, of um, dying from COVID. Um, and it's 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 a, a one. Of, it's based on data um, in the United States, and it's a really rigorous, well done calculator. There's a couple of really good articles about it that have been published. Um, but one of the challenges is it doesn't include disability at all. Um, so if you go back to this for a second, and I went back and double checked it to see if it had been updated. None of these categories mentioned disability of any kind, intellectual and developmental disability or other disability. Now true, there's some overlap of disability with some of these conditions, but given what I showed you earlier in the talk about how significant the risk factor is for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, it's really concerning that that data isn't on here. Um, and so why isn't that data on here? There's probably a variety of reasons. One is we don't collect information about disability um, very well um, through a lot of our data. Um, and second of all, I think there are lots of reasons why we actually make assumptions about disability, particularly in projects that use big data. And that's something that's been known for some time. Um, the top um, article here is something that was done by Microsoft Research, looking at uh, how algorithmic bias hurts people with disabilities. Um, and then below is another article about disability bias and AI. So the fact and a conference that was actually held at NYU um, in collaboration with Microsoft. So I think it's important to realize that, again, this is like many things in the COVID pandemic, the bias in big data and AI analysis with disability is not new. And yet um, we're kind of continuing to perpetuate it in a way that may be still um, disproportionately affecting um, this very vulnerable population. I want to mention telehealth and disabilities. Um, uh, as, as everybody here knows, there's been in many ways um, lots of wonderful advances and expansions in thinking about telehealth and making telehealth more available to people um, during the pandemic. And I really hope that those um, uh, changes in policy, changes in reimbursement, changes in technology continue um, as the pandemic starts to ease a little bit, we hope. Um, but there are some challenges um, that, again, existed before the pandemic in how we can implement telehealth for people with disabilities. Um, this is an article that came out again in 2020, looking at some of the barriers and challenges for people with disabilities. I wanna give a shout out to my colleague, Mathi Srinivasan from our department for some of the work she's doing specifically on thinking about telehealth and people with disabilities. Um, it's really important work. Um, I also collaborated with um, a wonderful group of people, including my colleague Megan Halley, early in the pandemic in doing a online survey of families with rare and undiagnosed diseases about how they were experiencing the pandemic. Um, and I wanted to share a couple of quotes from that um, that work um, specifically about telehealth and there were both limitations and strengths for people with rare and undiagnosed diseases who almost always have a disability as well. Um, some people said that doctor's appointments were less thorough if they were telehealth. Um, some people said that their internet made it challenging, which I think was true for a lot of online activities. Um, and this last quote is an example of um, someone saying that actually telehealth made their life easier, and particularly the fact that insurance was covering it, that previously they'd had to travel many hours to see a specialist and now they could use a computer and get lab tests done locally. So I think this is an example of both the potential promises and the potential challenges of using telehealth for people with disabilities. Um, as we heard at the beginning in our announcements, um, there have been some recent changes to um, liberalize and open up visitation um, uh, in this pandemic. And I think that's fantastic and I hope that continues. Um, but there have been significant challenges both locally and nationwide with thinking about how we can be cautious about visitation and risk, um, epidemiologic risk from COVID-19 and people with disabilities. Um, early in the pandemic, uh, many institutions in many states actually did not allow anyone to come into the hospital with people whether or not they actually had COVID-19. And that was really a significant challenge to many people with all kinds of disabilities because many of them actually require a family member with them to actually help them navigate, communicate, take care of things um, from all different kinds of disabilities. Um, and again, as with the ventilator triage um, uh, uh, 
scenario, um, many disability activists and patients actually um, employed the Office of Civil Rights and sued. And there were some um, decisions that, for example, in Maryland, that hospitals had to allow disabilities to have caregivers accompany them. Um, in Connecticut, for example, um, the OCR resolved complaints. Um, and, and it was really difficult. And I think it actually brought up some of the issues that exist, again, in medicine and our society about why people with disabilities require someone to be with them and what we think of as a disability um, and what we think of as a quote unquote real disability. And I think um, uh, um, it, it was quite striking to me. This brought up a lot of different issues um, about how we think about disability and the experience of healthcare. We talked about the architectural architectural inaccessibility of our healthcare institutions, but there's also inaccessibility um, both in COVID and other times and how we think about how family members and sometimes personal care assistants are really critical to allow people with disabilities to fully experience um, and get the benefits from healthcare. Some of you may have noticed that there's been some controversy um, in 2022 so far about the CDC and their views of disability. Um, this came out early in January when Dr. Walensky um, unfortunately made a comment um, uh, where she was talking about um, a, a study um, that showed that the people who were dying of COVID were disproportionately people with four or more, co at least four comorbidities. Um, and unfortunately, she made a comment where she said that was really encouraging. Um, and that sort of exacerbated the fact that many um, uh, people with disabilities, both scholars and um, advocates, felt like the CDC was really not considering um, and their policies the increased risks experienced by people with different kinds of disabilities, and including people who are immune compromised. Um, so there actually was um, quite a lot of public press about this, and over 100 leading national institutions, um, uh, including many that you have heard of, um, met with Dr. Walensky and other, mem other um, leadership uh, people from the CDC. Um, and as a result of that meeting, um, the CDC CDC committed to regular ongoing meetings and consultation with disability stakeholders. Um, they agreed to ground, uh, they, they, and the, the disability advocates also asked the CDC to ground their isolating guidance in public health evidence and, and the impacts on those at most risk um, and taking action to center people with disabilities. Unfortunately, that conversation and controversy has continued. Um, uh, just earlier this week, the same over 100 disability rights organizations um, sent and publicized another letter to the CDC with great concerns about the updated guidelines um, last week and the fact that they uh, are quite dismissive of the increased risk of people with disabilities disabilities, including people who are immune compromised. Um, and I think they have some really legitimate points. And I recommend that you take a look at some of that information um, if you'd like to learn more about it or reach out to me and I'm happy to share it with you. Um, but this is an example of how um, increasingly conversations about accessibility and inclusion and discrimination for people with disabilities is, is really being amplified during the COVID-19 pandemic um, and um, challenging us all to think more broadly and openly about how we think about um, healthcare that we provide to this po important population. So I am part of my argument and part of what I hope you'll come away from today is that we need empirical data about experiences, needs, and challenges of disabled people in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, uh, as well as other kinds of healthcare and healthcare situations. And um, I'm very happy to say that we're now beginning to do this, um, So, um, as are others. Um, so we received a um, engagement grant from PCORI, and my co-PI is um, Lisa Goldman Rosas from our own department. Um, and this grant um, has the broad mission of improving health and healthcare and health outcomes for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities in a measurable way. Um, and we're our goal is to um, uh, engage with adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, which in general does not get done um, very much, on four pressing topics in healthcare using patient centered outcomes research methodologies. And the four areas we're focusing on are emergency medicine, geriatric palliative health, uh, parallel palliative care, telehealth, um, and COVID 19 interventions. Um, and one of the key things about this project is that it's a collaboration and a partnership with the adults with IDD themselves, as well as parents of adults with IDD. Um, and our, our community advisory board also includes physicians, nurses, and social workers who specialize in these areas of focus and or IDD care, including several from the Department of Medicine. Um, we're going to use focus groups with adults with intellectual disabilities and rigorous tested uh, methodologies for doing focus groups with those populations, as well as alternative methodologies for collecting data from those who may not be able to fully participate in focus groups. And we're gonna use that data to try to draw what other kinds of research needs to be done and what kinds of solutions might actually support um, improving care and accessibility for this population. 
Um, this is just a picture of some of the community advisory board members um, uh, on one of our calls um, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We were talking about ordering and getting the tests that were available through the federal government. And you can see that two of them are holding up um, the tests that they received in the mail. Um, and we've already gotten very interesting data from them and we're really looking forward to um, expanding and continuing the project. One of the other key parts of the PCORI grant is to develop a, a, a virtual health forum um, to host monthly didactic and discussion sessions about adults with intellectual disabilities, health and healthcare. These are going to be open to the public with a range of stakeholders, and I really encourage um, anyone here who's interested to join. We're also going to record them and make them available online. Um, and uh, I want to just tell you about a couple of the speakers coming up because we're very excited about it. On March 23rd, um, Ryan Easterly, who's the executive director of the WIV Foundation, will be speaking. Um, the with Foundation is really amazing um, in that it funds and promotes um, uh, projects related to the establishment of comprehensive health care for the IDD population um, and really uh, also um, uh, engages and works closely and in partnership with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities themselves. And they've done some really important work nationally um, in COVID-19 in this population. So we're very excited that um, he'll be able to come talk with us. And then on April 27th, um, Bonnie Lynn Sweeno from, John, from Johns Hopkins, who I'd mentioned earlier, who helped develop the COVID disability dashboard, also recently had this really um, nice uh, piece in the New England Journal about disability inclusion as a key component of research day diversity. She's going to come talk with us about some of her work as well on April 27th. So um, that's going to be very exciting. So um, I'd like to sort of uh, wrap up this section with a call to action. Um, and uh, I think. If you come away with anything from this talk today, I really hope that one of the messages is that we must listen um, to disabled people. Um, and that is sometimes hard. Um, I had thought about doing a poll to see how many people here, um, new people with disabilities, um, either personally in their personal lives or, or through friends, not just through um, patients. Um, and, but sometimes that's hard to do, but I think it's really important for people to do. Um, and I think there are a lot of really wonderful ways to do that now that didn't exist in the past. We can um, read and share voices on Twitter and in journalism and advocacy who are talking about the experiences of people with disability and health and public health, um, also talking about intersectionality between disabilities um, and race and uh, socioeconomic status, which I'm not going to get to talk about today, but which is a very serious and important um, challenge as well. Um, and these, um, the things we talk about and share should include experiences seeing a doctor, getting medicine, being full participants in health healthcare, but also public health issues that occur outside the clinic, like transportation, mental health safety, and um, police violence. People with disabilities are disproportionately affected by police violence. So I think these are really important uh, issues for us to try to listen to disabled people. Um, and we really have to lead with what um, my, what um, a, a colleague who I'm going to mention in a minute calls a justice imperative. I think we need to apply a conceptual framework of disability um, in the context of human diversity, the lifespan, uh, wellness, injury, and social cultural environments. And we need to develop um, uh, the, the competency and the um, ability and confidence of healthcare providers to know what the needs of this population are and to meet them, and institutions as well, to make meeting the needs of people with disabilities a priority for institutions as much as serving the healthcare needs of other populations is a priority for healthcare institutions. Um, part of that is understanding the legal requirements um, that the ADA, the Rehabilitation Act, and the Social Security Act have um, that require us to actually make healthcare more accessible to people with disabilities and make that something we prioritize and something that we publicize. Um, and I think we really need to engage and collaborate with um, people within and outside our own disciplines to provide high quality interprofessional team-based healthcare um, to people with disabilities. And I um, wanted to um, uh, end with a, a couple of things. First, a quote from um, Dr. Alondra Nelson, who, as many of you know, was recently uh, promoted to be the director of the White House Office of Science, Technology, and Policy, and also um, does a lot of work in bioethics. And she um, spoke at the Hastings Center, and this link will be at the bottom of this slide, um, about embracing a braver bioethics in medicine. And she talks about a new paradigm for bioethics. And she says, at its best, bioethics enables people and communities that have been objects of science scientific scrutiny, technological surveillance, to find spaces to be subjects and agents and empowered people in science and medicine. And so in the context of this talk, I think that's disabled people and maybe bioethics and medicine together to co can collaborate to make um, disabled people be subjects in agents and empowered people. Um, and I think she's also calling for a focus, not just on individuals, but also on communities and systems, especially those who are enfranchised. So I really um, recommend her talk on this. She um, raised some really amazing points that have influenced a lot the way I think about these issues.
And I think we need to focus on the transformative potential, going back to my analogy of the, um, of the great rogue wave in the midst of turbulence from COVID-19. And I think this is true for a lot of um, disparities in COVID-19, but I think it's especially true for the disparities experienced by disabled people. Um, and I like this picture, which is a picture of a plant growing out of a, um, a volcano, um, which obviously had great destruction, but out of great destruction can also come beautiful things. Um, and so I, I really think this is an ongoing problem. And even as the COVID numbers change and some of our policies change, we can use the opportunity of what was highlighted and what we learned about um, the need for more inclusive healthcare policies and medicine towards people with disabilities to drive us forward in the things that we do and how we work in this area. And then I, I like to end with um, this quote by my, my friend, um, Paul Miller, who unfortunately died about 12 years ago. Um, he was a professor at the University of Washington School of Law. He was the EEOC commissioner from 1994 to 2004. Um, and he, he said this, when I was born, I know my parents were scared. They looked down at this little shriveled child and they wondered what my life would be like. Would I play ball? Would I have friends? Would I be able to do the things they dreamed that their son would do? And I have played ball a bit. I have always had fantastic friends. I have had good jobs and I have done a good job at them. Along the way, I have helped other people. I have a lovely wife and two beautiful daughters. I have had a marvelous life. And I just want my girls to know that everyone can and must have a marvelous life. And so um, I'll leave with a, saying a commitment to inclusive healthcare means a commitment to helping disabled people to live a marvelous life as they define it. And so um, hopefully from this talk, you've learned a little bit about how we can do that, both, both in COVID-19 and in other kinds of ways that we think about how we care for this population. I also just wanted to end with um, describing some of the work that I'm doing with other amazing people um, throughout our institution to try to um, increase um, educational opportunities for thinking about caring with people with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities specifically. Um, Pete Poulos and SMAID is also doing some amazing work on disabilities. Um, but in intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, we recently started a new chapter of the um, American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry, which is one of the professional organizations that really works in this area. Shout out to medical student Lauren Clark, who's done a lot of that work. Um, we had a patient panel in November for our first year medical students with adults with IDD for the first time. Um, we're holding a Special Olympics MedFest in May 2022 and looking for volunteers if, who want to work at that if you're interested. Um, we're integrating disability cases and best practices into other School of Medicine courses um, with the, um, especially the pre-clerkship um, directors group. Um, we're having a Q6 session um, coming up on caring for patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and then I am co-leading an elective um, this spring on caring with, for individuals with disabilities as well. So there are lots, this is just a subset of a lot of the opportunities. And if any of you are interested in getting involved, we, we could always use more people. So please, um, please feel free to reach out to me. And then the last thing I'll say um, is there are uh, one of the ways, as I mentioned, to listen to the voices of people with disabilities is to follow some of the amazing scholars and advocates on Twitter. This is a very small subset of them, um, but if you're looking for ways to get involved, I know a lot of people in the Department of Medicine are very active on Twitter, and this is one good way to hear some of those perspectives. And with that, I will stop and take some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tabor. Uh, that was, I think, probably very eye-opening for a lot of people, and you shared uh, so much information and covered so much ground. Uh, we have a number of comments and questions in the um, in the chat here. Um, before I get to those, though, I'm just going to um, take this opportunity to ask a question about masks, since you brought that up in um, the controversy with Dr. Walensky's comments and then the more recent um, shift in guidance. I have two kind of related questions. Um, one is um, when, when I personally have spoken out about masks and um, how lifting these mask mandates is ableist in my view, one of the things that has, so one, I guess is, uh, would, <laughs> do you agree with that take? And, um, and, and how can we do something, if you do, how can we do something about that? Because I think yesterday the 50th state, so all states now have revoked indoor mask mandates. Um, so that's number one. And then number two, I have heard concerns from people um, with hearing um, impairment saying that masks actually make things more difficult for them. Um, mm -hmm. And so I don't know, which makes sense because they can't read lips because we're not most of us using masks that have um, uh, transparent uh, sections in the middle. Um, and so I, I don't know how to resolve those two um, tensions. So just wanted to get your thoughts on yeah, that. It's an excellent question. Um, and I'll, I'll share with you what my opinion is. Um, I, I am very concerned about the current 
guidelines and trends and policies to lift mask mandates. I, I wish our society was a society where people were more willing to mask voluntarily. I do not think the data on one-way masking for people who are vulnerable, whether because of disability or immune compromise is convincing that that's actually effective for preventing transmission. Although of course the risk is lower when the overall prevalence in the population and the infection rate is lower. Um, but I do not think that there's convincing data that one-way masking is effective um, because I think there is convincing evidence that COVID-19 is airborne. Um, I, I know many people who are trans plant recipients um, who are immune compromised or are on immune compromising drugs, who have um, children and other family members who either are immune compromised or, or transplant recipients, cancer, um, undergoing cancer treatment, or who have significant intellectual and developmental disabilities and for reasons we only partly understand are at higher risk, who are absolutely terrified um, and, and, and very concerned that as a society, we are saying that we don't care. Um, and that their lives don't matter. Um, and I, I do understand where they're coming from on that. So my personal preference would be that um, in most indoor places, we were still um, really um, uh, modeling whenever we can wearing masks because it's the compassionate right thing to do to protect the people who are most vulnerable. And I won't go into the sort of ethics argument for why we should protect the most vulnerable, um, but um, I'm concerned about that. For hearing impairment, there was a lot of work about how to um, uh, um, address the fact that it's very hard for people to hear. As I mentioned, I've had some hearing loss and it is harder for me to hear people with masks. So I've had some first time experience with that. They do have some new masks that are not, to my knowledge, are not NIOSH approved, but are pretty effective that have the, the screen. I think it is also another opportunity to think about ways we can incorporate technology to do that. I also think that the, I, I'm forgetting the name of the person in our department um, who did it, but the signs, the pictures that people had during the pandemic with people's faces blown up on their, on their um, white coats was actually very effective um, in terms of sort of making more personal connections, particularly for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So those are great questions. Thank you, Sarah Argovine. No, thank you. That that all was very helpful. I appreciate your, your insight and comments there. There are, are quite a few questions in the chat, so let me uh, try to get to some of those. Um, one is uh, about a piece you wrote in Nature Genetics. This person says that you recently wrote a wonderful article in Nature Genetics about how to ensure that rare disease research is not forgotten and the connections between rare diseases are emphasized. I wonder if you could speak to what we can all do to further help further that agenda. Oh, that's a great question. Um, and, and very much related to other work I'm doing that I wasn't highlighting today. Um, I think um, I've been involved in genetics research, genomics research, including working with many wonderful people at Stanford who are involved in the UDN and, and other um, wonderful studies, really um, uh, leveraging the power of genomic technologies to solve rare diseases, to figure out the genetic causes of them, and then actually use that information to try to actually treat and help people with rare disease. But in that article, we talk a lot about how there's a need for more integrated integration and coordination across the funding agencies and the studies to actually leverage the data across multiple studies to um, try to solve the diseases and the causes for um, uh, patients who are not able to have their cause identified um, by these studies. Um, and that there's a lot we can learn from other kinds of studies and trials that have actually done that. Um, and also um, from other kinds of um, epidemiological models to try to actually do that, to look at what's shared across those rare conditions, um, not just think of each very ultra rare condition as its own um, own silo without any overlap with other organ other kinds of um, uh, diseases and conditions. I will say the other theme that's related to this is that many people um, with rare and undiagnosed diseases need to be involved as stakeholders in thinking about the research and thinking about um, how we think about continuing and expanding that research moving forward. So in that paper and some other things we've both written and are writing with my colleague Megan Halley, we're trying to address those issues and try to think about how we can think on a more um, global, inclusive, and integrated way of how to really um, uh, transform the way we think about rare and undiagnosed disease research and treatment. So thank you for the question. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing so much <clears throat> really important critical work uh, and we appreciate you. Um, I, I wanted to um, share another question about AI, which you mentioned earlier. Um, a couple of folks have questions about, you know, what, what can we do to kind of correct um, the biases that are in these AI algorithms or to encourage collection of data from people with disabilities so that they can be included. Is there anything that, you know, we all could do to, to kind of fix that problem? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think, um, 
there is there are some efforts, as I mentioned, including by organizations like Microsoft to engage in conversations about how we can address these biases in AI. They're not dissimilar and they're parallel to some of the biases in AI related to race and ethnicity as well, and thinking about how we include that. I do think with disability, one of the things that's really important is we just don't measure disability consistently and accurately across medical records, claims databases, other kinds of things. And so I think one of the important things is getting the data. And if we have the data, then the next thing is to make sure that we actually build models that include the data and that we don't accidentally build models that may be based on implicit or explicit bias into the way we think about how we're modeling them in AI. Um, so I am in no way an AI expert, but there are a lot of my colleagues, including David Magnus and Mildred Cho um, and Nicole Martinez, who are working on AI and thinking about ethics in AI. And I think this is actually a really high priority issue to think about, you know, AI is incredibly powerful and has great potential, but as a result, it can also really perpetuate a lot of biases, stigma, and discrimination in our society. So I think the data collection is number one. And then number two is thinking about how to include stakeholders and how to think in a really unbiased way about the modeling that we do in AI. Yeah, and to your point, it, this isn't just an issue for uh, disabilities, right? And we know that um, a lot of times these models are based on real life data and real life data incorporates all of our biases. So whether it's about race or age or gender or abilities, if we don't counteract the biases that are already existing in our real world when we make these AI, AI algorithms, then we're just going to, as you said, perpetuate them. Um, there's another comment here about, um, this one relates to accessibility. Um, and, and you know, for me, one of the things that struck me was when you were talking about the data from physicians and um, and also you mentioned that I think about half of practices how were accessible for people, which is just a shockingly low number. Um, so kind of two related questions, one that comes from the chat and one that comes from me, which is about um, what are things that people in practice can be doing to, to create more accessibility in their clinics. And then the, the question that comes from the chat is related to that. This person says curb cuts help everyone. Uh, what modifications would you suggest Stanford adopt today that would be like curb cuts that improve the healthcare experience for everyone, but would be disproportionately helpful for the disabled? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the question. Curb cuts are an excellent example. And for people who are not aware, and, and most people are not aware, the history of curb cuts and the um, disability rights and accessibility movement is very, very interesting. And it's something we take for granted now in a lot of places. Um, although even though curb cuts are accessible, it's interesting with a lot of our sidewalk dining during COVID-19, all of a sudden sidewalks and walkways suddenly became inaccessible to people with wheelchairs. So even though curb cuts were an improvement in our society, you know, it's amazing the ways in which a lack of awareness of the experiences of people with disability and their access still creeps into our daily lives. Um, so I think that's an interesting point to be made. Um, I actually think there's a lot of things we could do. Um, I think there's a lot of really exciting things we can do, some of which I think are, are relatively easy. Um, I think we could actually engage um, in really examining our clinics and, and talking to people with disabilities about what's hard and what's easy. Um, I think one of the things I've found as a parent is that many pediatric clinics tend to have really loud televisions with cartoons blaring incredibly loudly in the waiting rooms. Um, I know this is not a pediatrics audience, but most of you you have probably taken your kids to one of these clinics if you have kids. Um, and if you haven't, maybe you've worked in one of those clinics or trained in one of those clinics. Um, and for people with intellectual disabilities, autism, people with sensory difficulties, it is impossible to sit in those waiting rooms. Absolutely impossible. And um, we've gotten to the point where my oldest son actually goes up to the receptionist and, and says, you know, you need to turn off the TV because I can't sit here otherwise. Um, so that's an example of some of the things we could really look at and do differently. I think there are a lot of healthcare institutions that put some amazing online modules about what it will be like when you come to the doctor um, that describe things like accessibility um, and have um, particular um, links on their websites about um, information for people who are disabled, who are coming to the hospital or coming to the healthcare institution. I think that's something that to my knowledge, we don't do a lot of that would be very easy to do. And I think there are a lot of people here who would be very interested in participating in that. Um, I think the other things that we're teaching the medical school about, uh, the medical students about, and the PA students about is best practices for how to interact with patients and how to think about their challenges. That's a different kind of accessibility how to interact with someone with a wheelchair, how to talk to someone who has an intellectual and developmental disability. There's a lot of empirical data that people in medicine are just um, nurses, doctors, everybody, PA students are just not trained um, how to um, uh, respectfully and appropriately um, work with patients with um, disabilities in general and intellectual and developmental disabilities um, specifically. And so we really need to move the needle by changing the way we do the training. And then like we do with other kinds of training issues, continuing to do continuous education um, through, you know, with all different levels of healthcare providers.
So that's some ideas. I think there are more and I'm really open to hearing more. So if people want to reach out to me, I and Pete Poulos and other people are, are very interested in these issues. Yeah, there's clearly so much work um, that needs to be done. I really love the idea of um, making more information available on our websites, um, the you know, various SHC and NDOM websites about <clears throat> what people can expect when they come that I agree with you. That seems like a simple yet very helpful thing to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a question here about um, that I think related to that last powerful quote that you shared with us about living a marvelous life um, and, and how that's at odds with the data that you presented on what people think of the quality of life of people with disabilities. Um, and you know what you're obviously doing a lot, I think, to change those perceptions. Um, what else um, should we all be doing to change that narrative about um, the lives of people with disabilities? Oh, well, that could be a whole nother talk, but I'll mention a couple of things. I think I think both as a as a, a person who works in this department and faculty in this department and as a parent and as a friend of people with disabilities, I think one of the most important things that we all can do on this call is to be really reflective and reflexive in our own encounters with people with disabilities. Um, I think most of us have grown up in a society that is in, very ableist and that views people with disabilities as somehow not having marvelous lives and as it being a tragedy if someone has a disability, which isn't just say there aren't serious and important challenges for many people with disabilities, but that's usually based on media portrayals of people with disabilities and not actually knowing people with disabilities. So I often teach medical students just in the ethics thread, um, not even the disability component of it, that it's really important to examine your own biases when you see patients and think about why you may have certain assumptions. Think about whether it's really appropriate to just be talking louder to someone with a disability um, because you think they're not going to understand you. Um, uh, other kinds of biases about whether or not you think someone with a disability may need to be asked the same questions you ask other adults about sexual health. Um, so those kinds of things I think are really important to be reflective about. Um, I am really pleased that a lot of the journals that many of us read are starting to publish more articles about disability, disability bias. Um, and I think that will help people become more aware of it. Um, I also want to um, recommend that there's um, some wonderful podcasts. Again, people people listen on their way to work um, uh, about disability in medicine in general. Um, Lisa Meeks and Pete Poulos have a podcast about um, disability in medicine and, and also focusing on providers who have disabilities as well. And they've done some amazing work um, in that area. So I think I think that's one way that we can try to change that. I think the other thing is to hear people's stories. Um, I, I think um, and hear that people with many disabilities do actually perceive that they have a marvelous life. Um, and and uh, it, it, like all biases, um, it's very important. It's very hard to be aware of your own biases, but it's incredibly important. Absolutely. Um, and I did put the link to the Stanford Medicine Alliance for um, disability inclusion and equity in the chat. So if folks are interested in, in that work, that's the group that Dr. Poulos um, helps lead um, and has founded. Um, so if people are wanting to get involved locally, that's one way to do so. Um, one, uh, I guess, you know, last question in our last couple of minutes um, is an important one that, that comes to from our audience. And um, Oh, by the way, I just want to note that there are lots of very positive comments in the chat. Oh. Um, thanking you for your presentation and um, the work that you're doing and, and, and people, I think, got a lot out of, of what you shared so far. So the last question um, that I would love for you to, you know, give just a couple of thoughts on. It's another big question <laughs> that we're not going to, you know, fully solve in the next two minutes. But um, this person says, do you have thoughts on ways we can make medical training more disability accessible? In my experience, many of the requirements of both medical school and residency do not accommodate people with differing abilities. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I am very pleased to say that there's been a lot of great discussions about that going on, even in the last couple of years. Um, again, some of the work that Pete and Lisa and other people have done have really focused on, um, on providers who have disabilities and also paths to make it easier for people who have disabilities to do different kinds of medical training. Um, uh, I, I, I feel like we're moving in positive directions with that, but I think um, there have been a lot of narratives that are published by amazing uh, physicians, several of whom trained at Stanford, um, who have disabilities, including physical disabilities, about some of the challenges at just walking and keeping up with rounds or um, uh, attendings who like to take the stairs, um, things that we all sort of take for granted in terms of people with physical disabilities. So I think, again, it kind of requires thinking outside the box and kind of shaking everything up and saying, you know, what do we do that we're not even aware of that may unintentionally create barriers um, to having people with disabilities be involved in our profession? And I do think that like other aspects of, of diversity and equity, having more people with disabilities and 
disability experiences will actually improve the way that medicine as a whole um, is equitable and accessible to people with disabilities. So I, I do think it's really important. I will say again that I have been working closely at the School of Medicine to try to think about ways to include disability in all aspects, particularly of our pre clerk cur curriculum. Um, and uh, I think there's definitely lots of work to still do there. So if there are people here who are interested in being part of it, we definitely, definitely welcome more involvement. Yeah, no, I agree. I think there's more um, talk about this now than probably ever in the past. And I just put a link in the chat to a piece that was written by one of our own medical students, um, Sushi Restogi, on her experience um, and needing accommodations during her, in particular, her clerkship clerkship time um, at Stanford. And you know, if you haven't read that, I would I would recommend reading it. Go ahead, Dr. Shaver. Yeah, the other thing I want to say um, that's hard for people is, um, you know, it even happens for things like Zoom. So many of you may have heard this, but I mean, um, many people with disabilities actually find the, the fact that we've had increased availability of things like meetings and grand rounds on Zoom to actually make it more accessible to them because it's hard for them to potentially get there, harder for them to get to an in-person meeting and then back to where they're supposed to be in the same amount of time that it is for some somebody who doesn't identify currently as disabled. Um, so, so I think um, captioning is another kind of thing that we take for granted. I'm trying to think about even small ways and best practices. I also would love to see us come up with shared best practices for things we're going to do for all um, meetings and activities throughout the School of Medicine to try to promote accessibility at every opportunity we get. And I, I think that's something that a lot of people are interested in and we, that we can do. Oh, I, I agree completely. That's like another easy um, win, right? We're all looking for, for easy wins as a start um, because there's so much that we could be doing differently to accommodate so many different people um, in both in our training, but also for, for our patients. Um, so I think we're at time, but thank you so much for um, your time and being with us today, Dr. Tabor, and sharing your expertise. Um, and hopefully we've got a lot of people thinking now about um, maybe more than they were before about people with disabilities and how we can better care for them. Thank you all for being here today. Um, Dr. Dunn just dropped another link in the in the chat. Um, I see Dr. Har Harrington is applauding. Um, and I think that's a sentiment that we all are feeling right now. So thank you so much. And everybody have a wonderful day. We'll see you next week.